Closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. California's recovery could be jeopardized by lower than projected tax revenues and by a court ruling against withholding lawmakers' pay if they don't pass a budget on time. May Day demonstrations by labor, immigrant rights, and Occupy groups were mainly peaceful with the exception of a few splinter groups. New studies now recommend mammograms for women in their 40s with high risk factors. How will communities cope with the coming collision course between coast and climate? I'm Craig Miller. I'll ask the head of NOAA's Coastal Services Center in a Climate Watch conversation coming up. I'm Belva Davis, and welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me tonight on our news panel are Lisa Alaferis, editor for KQED's State of Health, David Bacon, New America Media's associate editor, and Josh Richmond, Bay Area News Group's political reporter. You're back, Josh, with news about the state budget. That's not new for you. How bad is the news this time? Uh, pretty bad. You know, it's uh, when you consider how many dozens of times we've talked about this just on this show, you, you have to sort of put it in, in, in the context of all of those other bads. But the news is that uh, uh, Standard & Poor, the credit agency, uh, issued a memo this week saying that uh, we may be in even more trouble. We're al we already have the lowest credit rating of, of any state, but we may be even in even more trouble if lawmakers can't pass a, a balanced budget by its June 15th deadline. And, and we've got two major complications for that. One, we're short on revenues again. We started the, this, this calendar year knowing that we had about a $9 billion deficit. And now uh, we've got somewhere in the vicinity of another $3 billion in revenue shortfalls since then. Uh, including, uh, by, by controller John Chung's estimate, $2 billion that we fell short just in April. Uh, so it's a pretty dire situation. We're just not pulling in enough money to pay the bills uh, it, it, over the course of the year. Um, at the same time, we had a court ruling uh, in which uh, part of Prop 25 from a while ago basically got tossed out. A Sacramento judge ruled that the state controller doesn't have the authority to withhold pay from lawmakers. Uh, Prop 25 had said that they can't get paid if they don't pass a budget by this deadline. Um, now, that wasn't going to save billions of dollars not paying lawmakers. It was meant as a punitive measure. But the fact is, if, if they are left to decide whether or not they've done a good job and passed a balanced budget, uh, it, it doesn't really act as much of a punitive measure at all. Go ahead. Please. No, I, I was just going to say, so, so we're left in a position now where the governor is going to roll out his May budget revision on, on May 14th. He's already been saying for several weeks now that it is not going to be pretty. It's going to involve more cuts uh, and, and cuts, frankly, to, to areas that people don't like cutting. You can't, can't really make significant cuts to the state budget without touching education, without mm -hmm. cutting touching health well, and human services. Let's roll so. back a little bit because sure. you hit three big home runs there in terms of bad news. <laughs> <laughs> number <Thanks>. one, <laughs> and number one, why were the revenues? Does anybody give a reason? Is the economy not growing at the rate we thought? So let's deal with that one the, first. The, the economy is continues to struggle here in California. There are a couple of, of reasons for that, most likely. Uh, it, 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 it's worth noting that the unemployment rate in California upticked in March while it went down nationally. We are having trouble creating and, and keeping jobs here, uh, and that obviously has a, a, a direct effect on, on revenue and taxes. Um, and we're still struggling with the housing 
mortgage meltdown, uh, which, which hit California harder than many other states. This is a, a very deep hole to try to get ourselves out of. And, and what Governor Brown is saying is that it, it, it's getting somewhat better, uh, but we're still challenged. It's going to take years to work our way out of this. And in the meanwhile, there's got to be ways to, to, to balance the budget and pay the bills. Uh, you know, it, it's worth noting that, that the governor is looking ahead to having a measure on November's ballot that would boost uh, income taxes on uh, temporarily for, for several years uh, uh, on, on earnings over a quarter of a million dollars. It would boost the state sales tax and use tax by half a cent for four years. And 89% of that would go to K-12 education, 11% would go to community colleges, because these are the areas that, that seem so threatened. Well, Josh, Josh in, in relation to the governor's proposal, or mm -hmm. actually the governor's teacher's proposal, there right. are a lot of people besides the governor who are, who are for this. Mm -hmm. um, now it appears as though there may be other initiatives on the ballot as well, too. And I think the common wisdom is that the more initiatives there are on the ballot about tax increases, the less likely it is that any one of them is going to pass. The yeah. latest one I've heard about now is this one that's sponsored by this rich German industrialist, Nicholas Bergruen, mm -hmm. who says he's going to give $20 million to what California Forward, California Forward. Forward an, an initiative. Um, this is an organization that last time around proposed an initiative that would actually reduce personal income taxes. Right. So are these spoilers? Well, the, the the more immediate threat I think to the, that 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 the governor's uh, initiative sees is from a, a competing tax measure that's being put forth and funded by Molly Munger, which would also be an income tax increase, but not confined to uh, everybody. It would be a, it would be across a, a scaled across the spectrum of, of income levels. The California Forward thing is more of a governance reform thing, uh, but but they're also trying to not clutter the November ballot with too many of these things because it's seen by some as a potential spending cap, essentially. Time is short. But that's looking way ahead to November. Right. In the meantime, they've got to pass a budget. They've got to pass a budget. They're supposed to pass it by June 15th. There have been many years when they, it's stretched on into the fall. Uh, Prop 25 was supposed to cut that short. You know, we'll, we'll probably have some sort of budget by June 15th. Whether it actually works uh, remains to be seen. We're out of time, but tell me this. If the governor prevails and his measures pass, will that fill this $12 billion shortfall you're talking about? I don't about? think so, but it'll help. It will help. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's encouraging. <laughs> that's encouraging. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Josh. Um, you have some news, too, that has many answers to critical questions. Number one, about the Occupy movement and mm -hmm. their tactics, where they're going and what they want, and the damage that some people uh, under that banner have done. Well, looking at what just happened this past week, Belva, you know, on May Day, I think, first of all, May Day was a big success for Occupy movements around the country. New York had 30,000 people in the street, which was the largest Occupy demonstration yet anywhere so far. And here in San Francisco, we had a really big one at the corner of Market and Montgomery Street, where about 1,000 people shut down the financial district for a couple of hours and talked about the banks and foreclosures. And um, we had in Oakland, uh, march from the Fruitvale BART station uh, towards downtown Oakland that we've had these marches every May Day actually because these are also the immigrant rights marches but here what we saw coming together were immigrant rights groups and Occupy groups um, basically uh, promoting the idea of equality and, and rights for immigrants um, and there were a lot of other things that happened in the you know spectrum of activities that took place on May Day. Unions, for instance, um, got together with Occupy to picket the ferry building because ferry workers are trying to get a contract, or nurses at Sutter, or um, retail workers and janitors at Westfield Mall. But there were also um, some incidents in which windows got smashed and property got trashed, both on Valencia Street the night before and then in downtown Oakland in the afternoon and, and the evening. And, and what about this discussion within Occupy about tactics, about whether that makes that kind of act, action makes sense? Well, I think I have a, a, a couple of quotes here, actually, of uh, people who are on both sides of this. So it kind of gives you the flavor of, of what the debate is about. So somebody who is in favor of what was taking place, which are these actions that are being conducted by what's being called the black bloc, um, said, even to make the most modest gains, we have to show that we can fully disrupt the system. 
in other words, you know, this idea of extreme militancy and, and tactics. And then somebody else who I think not only represents a point of view in Occupy, but also of a lot of other community organizations and unions who are trying to cooperate with Occupy saying the point gets lost in meaningless rumbles with the police. In other words, that the media tends to focus on the violence and on the confrontations with the police, and you don't get any media coverage of a thousand people sitting down in the intersection of um, Market and but, Montgomery Street. But the division within Occupy itself then suggests it's a, uh, a movement without a coherent focus. I think it, it suggests a kind of a free form movement in which, first of all, what they call it in Occupy is the idea of diversity of tactics. This is kind of a movement, if you think about what the wobblies in our own history were like, or the history of anarchism in, in this country, where you have an organization that deliberately doesn't choose leaders, that makes its decisions in general assemblies where anybody can participate, where the decisions have to be made by consensus. So I think what people do get united around are what they see as the problem. In other words, the 99% 1%, I think that's an Occupy idea, and it's by now not just an Occupy idea, I think it's one that's caught fire among lots and lots of people, the idea that we're living in a country in which we're divided between a very tiny number of very wealthy people and a very large number of people who have very little. Well, what is, what is next for Occupy? I mean, now we know that clearly that there are divisions, not everybody agrees. What does it do to the people who normally got a message out about labor problems or immigrant problems who uh, all of that got suppressed? You, you bought that up. So are those groups becoming impatient with Occupy? Impatient, yes, but I don't think that um, looking at what's happened in San Francisco here, for instance, I don't think unions are about to give up on Occupy at all. In fact, I think there's kind of an overlap in some ways between those people in Occupy who did things like the occupation of the intersection at Mar Montgomery and Market Street and people who did the demonstrations against the Wells Fargo shareholder meeting the week before, basically protesting against, um, on the one hand, lots of foreclosures and on the other hand, lots of profits for the bank. So that alliance, I think, is a very firm one, and I think that's going to continue. I think what's a lot more up in the air is this question of what Occupy's relationship is to the black bloc and to the people who do the, um, you know, the confrontations the with the police. And the black bloc are those kids that wear, or people that wear the, the, the hoodie shirts, is that who Well, they they're are? people who wear black and they wear masks, usually, mm -hmm. to disguise their identity, I think. So, it, so we, I guess we're in the process of still trying to understand. <laughs> yes, and I think that there, you know, people are debating a, a lot of other different tactical ideas as well too. You know, should Occupy concentrate on, for instance, trying to maintain um, what they would call their turf, another, or you know, things like the tent encampment in Justin Herman Plaza, or recently on May Day, for instance, they mm -hmm. reoccupied a building belonging to the diocese, yeah. trying to convert it into a community center. So that's one set of ideas. Another one are these sort of mobile demonstrations the, that take place during well, protests. The thread between your story and Lisa's story is that people uh, can't agree on what always that's is right, the best yes. tactic that's to cure a pretty true. bad problem. So Lisa, with you, it's women and trying to decide whether to have mammograms or not. Okay, so the, the, the debate is specifically, the studies that came out this week were specifically about uh, women in their 40s. So women 50 and over, women 50 to age 74 should continue to get their mammograms. But the, the debate has been around um, since the United States Preventive Services Task Force released their guidelines uh, three years ago saying that women in their 40s should talk to their doctor, that, it would, that they weren't making a firm recommendation either way. And this uh, created a firestorm of controversy. So the studies that came out this week looked at, um, looked at a, a series of databases of 15 million mammograms, really to see which women in their 40s were most at risk. And these were women with a first degree relative with breast cancer, a mother, sister, or daughter, or women with diagnosed dense breast tissue. And so that's where the researchers said these women had reached a tipping point where their risk was equal to that of women in their 50s and that these women should have a mammogram every other year. Um, not every year, they said that every year the harms would continue to outweigh the benefits. So, um, oh, and I should mention just uh, a million of these mammograms came from San Francisco and Marin counties. So 
the national database, but with the Bay Area. Could, could that be because Marin had such a sharp interest in this uh, topic? No, uh, it's for just years? because the there's a local researcher uh, at UC San Francisco, so she contributes uh, from from her area. These uh, mammograms are from her area, but um, this is one in five women in their 40s, and uh, the the researchers who publish these studies are excited because they say it's leading toward this um, risk-based screening. Now, people. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you about uh, uh, other risk factors, Lisa, mm -hmm. because you, you mentioned, too, dense mm -hmm. breast tissue and, mm -hmm. and the history of, of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But um, there are other risk factors mm -hmm. for people getting breast cancer as well, mm -hmm. too. People who take oral contraceptives, people who don't have kids, um, women who have children after they're 30. Mm -hmm. Is that also an so indicator they, that you should get a mammogram? No, they, th these women are at elevated lifetime risk. But the, the data that the, the researchers looked at specifically, and they talked about, they looked also at alcohol. Alcohol has been associated with higher risk. But they were looking specifically at a number of risk factors, and these were the two that they said rose to mm. this tipping point where, the, the, where a woman's risk was, this is in her 40s. This is not lifetime risk. These are women in their 40s. So, um, uh, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, no. I thought you were about to ask me something. No, so. I was just going to say, had there been evidence prior to this, during the whole time of confusion after the first announcement that maybe women shouldn't get these, it was, these so, so I spoke with Carla Kurlikowski, who's a, uh, an epidemiologist at UC San Francisco and one of the mm -hmm. co-authors, and she said it was actually after the United States Preventive Services Task Force issued their recommendations that the National Cancer Institute asked for researchers to look more directly at this population of women in their 40s to try and assess when, you know, who was at highest risk, who should receive mammograms to try and address this question. Because women in their 40s, of course, do get breast cancer. Does so cost play into that as well? It was, it was not a question mm -hmm. of cost. Mm -hmm. It was, and the studies were funded by the NCI because mm -hmm. there's, just because there's been so much mm -hmm. debate around this. And the, and the other mm -hmm. data, until this point, the other data, radiologists will tell you that the, the data up to this point was old and from uh, from outside the US, from Canada, from Europe, but mostly that the data had been collected in the 70s or 80s, and so when mam mammographic technology was, was different. Mm -hmm. And so let's look at current technology, let's look at American women, and let's, uh, but this, this is also one study, it confirms what came out last summer, but this is by no means the final word. Okay, so what harm is done? by having these mammograms. What can happen is that, uh, so Otis Brawley, in, who wrote an accompanying editorial in the, where the, in the journal where these studies were published, he's the chief medical officer of the American Cancer Society, and um, he, he said he worried that mammography had been oversold to, to American women. And women have this belief that they have a mammogram and it will detect anything that's wrong, that will detect breast cancer, and that they will not they will not die from breast cancer. They will not, or that it will be caught early and they won't have to have more serious treatment. But what can happen the, with younger women and because of the way their breasts are is that they can uh, be subjected to false positives where they would then have to have additional screening. They would then perhaps have to have a biopsy, which is, which is a surgical inter intervention. I mean, it's not. It's not. Is this its really boiling down to money, costs, healthcare costs? It, it it is a contributor. There, there's no question that the more we do to people, the more it costs. Mm -hmm. But the the reason that they're looking at it is to try and determine who's going to benefit the most. Okay. So, all right. Thank you, Lisa. Well. <laughs> Threats posed by rising sea levels and extreme weather patterns are changing the way California's coastal communities plan for the future. Craig Miller has the story in a Climate Watch conversation. When you add up all the bays and inlets, California has more than 3,400 miles of shoreline, several hundred just in the Bay Area. As the head of the Coastal Services Center for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Margaret Davidson has her eye firmly on the future of all this shoreline and the threats imposed from rising seas and more extreme weather. Davidson is based in South Carolina, but is a close watcher of California where coast and climate may be on a collision course. Now, when I talk to uh, climatologists about the specific climate threats to California, they usually mention two things first, you know, water supply issues mm -hmm. eventually mm -hmm. and mm -hmm sea level rise. The trouble with sea level rise is that it's happening very slowly. 
It's tough to motivate people. It has been happening very slowly. It's been happening on a geological time scale, which is, of course, very slow. Uh, we're seeing a, a fairly rapid acceleration of rates in the last hundred years, but that's still slow to a normal person's perception. Uh, but in the last 10 to 15 years, thought to be associated with things like the uh, uh, melting of the Greenland ice sheet uh, in places where it would be first to register, like the mid-Atlantic U.S., we've seen a dramatic rate of acceleration in sea level rise, relative sea level rise. The sea level rise, it's mm -hmm. an insidious thing. Yes, you know, yes. uh, People can't really see it happening. Yes. But I think a lot of times what they don't get is it's not just the rising sea levels, it's right. that in combination with the weather, the tides, right. and everything yes. else that's happening, yes. paint that scenario for us. Well, it's actually not the rate of local sea level rise per se that is the concern. It is the degree to which that amount of water on top of the volume that we have been knowing is going to contribute to increased, more frequent uh, episodes of flooding and more extensive flooding. And we're already seeing that in certain uh, portions of the Bay Area. And then if you also combine this with changes in uh, winter precipitation patterns and, and early snow melt, uh, it's now happening a month to two months earlier than it used to. And, and that's going to be a confounding problem under a variety of conditions, some of which are distinctly related to local sea level and some of which are related to changing patterns in, in rainfall. And we do have one of those triggers here, the so-called Pineapple Express, mm -hmm. what they call atmospheric rivers. Yes. Uh, these one storm right after another coming off the Pacific. That's the big fear, really, especially for places like Sacramento, which, are, which is well inland. That old uh, axiom about the butterfly who flaps its wings in Borneo uh, is actually real because m m the world's big weather maker used to be boiling up out of those very dense forests on that island that we used to call Borneo, and they sweep across the Pacific, and that drives the weather for the whole continental U.S., is that really big weather coming into the West Coast. And of course, we've, we've changed those patterns of weather. We've uh, logged much of uh, Borneo. Uh, we've also changed the cycles of the uh, warm, cool ocean, the whole El Nino, La Nina thing. Uh, but we're seeing really big weather patterns that we had not seen before. And, and like we were just seeing recently, uh, that can shift to the south a great deal. And, and California suddenly becomes a whole lot wetter in a very short period of time than it's used to. There's a plan in development right now uh, here in the Bay Area for an area known as Ocean Beach yes. uh, in San Francisco, aptly enough, because it's the part of San Francisco right. that fronts right on the Pacific, takes the yes. full brunt of it. Uh, for a long-range erosion management plan, they're actually talking about taking a major thoroughfare called the Great Highway, right. picking it up and moving it inland. I mean, how, how much of this are you seeing around the country, and is it... Uh, is that really the kind of thing we're looking at? Well, I, I certainly think in the case of uh, Ocean Beach, which I understand is a highly erosive environment, that if you actually want to have this pocket urban beach and its amenities in the future, you're going to have to give it room to move, as it were. Well, that project um, uh, might add up, uh, what I've seen, to $100 million. Yes. And that's just to deal with a very tiny slice of the California coast. You look at what would have to be done all up and down the coast yes. and in the bays and inlets yes. of California. Yes. You're talking about more than 800 miles of coastline. It's, uh, it, the costs coming at us are costs that we haven't had to face before either. Even as we think about reinvesting in public infrastructure in this country, which we we should do, uh, and in fact we must do if we think we want to remain uh, economically competitive in the world markets. Uh, I'm hoping that we will have the sensibility to also think about the hazard and climate resilience of our infrastructure. So let us not just design our roads and our sewers and our flooding systems for the conditions that we have known. Let us think about how we site and design that critical infrastructure for the conditions that are very likely to occur over the next 30 to 50 years. Margaret Davidson, thanks for taking a few minutes with us. Certainly, Craig. Happy to help.
Well, now some welcome news on the environmental front. After years of declining numbers, California's king salmon are finally making a comeback. State fish and game officials are predicting that this could be the biggest salmon run since 2005. To help kick off the commercial salmon season, last week fishermen flocked to Pillar Point Harbor to take part in a hundred-year-old tradition, the annual blessing of the fleet. God bless your going out and your coming in. Congresswoman Jackie Spear was also on hand to show her support for the fishermen and local businesses who hoped the salmon surge could help the industry recover from a series of poor harvests. And if the commercial fishermen have as much luck as these sports fishermen had that day, we could all be able to fire up our barbecues as early as this weekend. Well, that's all for tonight. My thanks to all of you for joining us here this evening. Visit us anytime at kqed.org slash this week for past episodes, to subscribe to our newsletter and our podcast, and to share your thoughts about the program. I'm Belva Davis. Thank you for watching. Good night. Funding for Climate Watch on This Week in Northern California is provided by the Mary Van Voorhees Fund and the Fallis Family Fund.